pray. Father God, we're glad to be free to worship you. We're free from our sin. We're free uh, to gather together this morning. And Father, we're thankful for all of these things that are only possible through your Son, Jesus Christ. Pray that you would walk with us as we go through this service today, that your word would speak clearly, that our hearts would be brought closer to Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Pastor Dan, why don't you come up with some announcements? You guys can smile at each other as you sit down. That's a good thing. Give a wave. <laughs> See, this is our new holy kiss, is it? I guess. <laughs> Well, welcome to Faith Fellowship Baptist Church once again, and we're uh, glad to see everyone here. Um, we still have our mask requirements and so on, and you, you all know the rules, and hope you're all washing your hands. You're basically doing what our mothers told us when we were growing up, right? <laughs> Wash your hands, you know, stay clean. If you're sick, stay at home. Uh, don't talk to strangers, uh, all that sort of thing. So just listen to your mothers. All right. Tuesday morning Bible study is still on, 10.30 every Tuesday morning. Uh, we're looking at starting some small groups as well. So if you're interested in a small group being part, uh, partaker of one or uh, participant in one, uh, let me know. Uh, we'll just try to find out what the uh, scent is. Uh, sentiments. Scent, sentiments are for uh, going forward. And uh, so we're looking at the possibility of small groups. And of course, Friday morning, uh, if you're able, 7.30 every Friday morning. Um, we have, of course, a, it's not in the bulletin, but it is a praise item, <clears throat> talking with Jeremy about the church finances. And even over the summer when giving goes down sometimes, he says we're uh, at, at par to last year or slightly ahead. And so we're very thankful for that And uh, as we head into the fall season. So praise the Lord for uh, his people as they give. All our missionaries are up to date and paid for. And Although their ministries have changed like our ministries have changed, uh, we're still serving the Lord as best we can. Amen? Slight amen there. That's good. All right. Um, so we want to look forward as well. We're going to be holding a communion service again on the first Sunday of October. So we're anticipating that. We're going to have those uh, prepackaged little communion cups. And Daniel and I, Pastor Daniel and I tried one. And we just want to give you a little bit of a warning that the wafer is not really... It, 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 <laughs> It's not really anything, <laughs> but it's, uh, <laughs> so we're working on the gluten-free aspect, but it's a little, uh, anyway, it's all prepackaged, and so we're trying to take care of that as well, but we'll have an opportunity to be together and celebrate communion, which is a very positive uh, step forward, I believe. And so next Sunday as well, we have a baby dedication for uh, Sean Aune, so we're looking forward to that, uh, Nana and Juanito's little boy, and so uh, met with them yesterday, and they're doing well, and uh, that's about it. Anything else? We need volunteers for some of the ministries as we anticipate them coming. Uh, for the youth, uh, we don't have any junior church yet because we're having two services. We don't have any Sunday school because we're having two services this way. But uh, we're looking at the possibility of starting a WANA in October as well as the youth uh, soon and uh, other ministries. So if you are looking for a place to serve, then contact Pastor Daniel or my, myself and we'll, we'll fit you in. The Christian life is a battle of desires. This is a phrase that my, one of my profs at Bible college often reminded the students. The Christian life is a battle of desires. And what he means by that is that in our life, inside of us, we have many desires. And we desire uh, things of this world but the Bible tells us we should desire things of Christ. And so we have this battle that begins to live inside of us when the Holy Spirit works and when we're drawn towards Christ, we begin to have this battle inside of us. Do we desire Christ or do we desire things of our flesh? And today we're going to look at a passage of scripture that challenges me and you to cherish Christ as our desire, as our joy, and as our treasure above anything else that we could uh, desire. Because Christ is the greatest, and indeed he's the only true and lasting joy and satisfaction that's available for you and for me. So if you would, turn with me to Philippians 3, and we're going to read the first nine verses of Philippians chapter 3 together. Uh, I don't have it up on the screen this morning, but you have your own Bible, so let's do that together. Why don't you stand with me 
Philippians 3, I'll be reading verses 1 through 9. Philippians 3, verses 1, actually just through 8, sorry, 1 through 8. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs, look out for the evildoers, look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seated. Now, just as a little side note, uh, I love how Paul starts this section with the word finally, because he's really only halfway through his letter. But he says, finally, brothers, rejoice in the Lord. And you know that he was maybe a preacher as well as a writer, right? Because halfway through, he says, finally, which sounds like when some pastors say, in conclusion, and they're only halfway through, right? They're going for a little while longer. So I want you to remember, if Pastor Dan or I ever say, in conclusion, and go for a while, we're not struggling to land the plane. We're just trying to be more like Paul which is a good thing, right? It says, finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. For some context on where we are in this letter, uh, Paul has spent chapters 1 and chapter 2 outlining that he's been thrown in prison. So this is where he's writing his letter from. He's been thrown in prison, but that's okay because the gospel is still being preached. That's a lot of what chapter 1 is about. He says, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. It's, it's all right. I'm in prison. I'm writing to you. There are gospels still being preached. It's okay. And in chapter 2, he says, consider Christ's example of humility, and that's what we need to do and follow in order to reach a crooked and depraved generation. And after that, he then encourages his readers to rejoice in the Lord. He's saying we live in the midst of a dark time. We live in the midst of a divisive time. We live in the midst of a time where the church is persecuted, where I've preached the gospel and I've been thrown in prison. And now he says, rejoice in the Lord. He says, it is no trouble to write this to you as he sits in his prison cell. Seems like an odd thing for you and me to read. If I was thrown in prison, I might have some trouble saying, rejoice. In the midst of current world circumstances in Paul's time, and we could say even in our time, some of us are having trouble saying, rejoice. How do we rejoice in the Lord? If we believe he's in control and we look at the world around us, how do we rejoice? There's a lot of bad stuff going on. How could Paul write this? And then he follows that up, not just saying it's no trouble to write it. He also says, and it is safe for you. How could, what, what does he mean by that? Well, the NIV maybe says it in a di- little different way. It says, it is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. So Paul, as he begins this section of his letter, he's, he's wary of the dangers of misplaced joy, of misplaced hope. And so as he walks through the rest of this verses, he outlines a warning and a boast and a loss that point us to true lasting joy and he says we need to rejoice in the lord not in the things of the world that's eventually where he's going he's saying though i'm in prison though the circumstances around us are are bad though the church is being persecuted you need to rejoice in the lord and that's actually a safeguard for you against all of these other things that are going on so he starts with a warning in verses two to three Uh, especially verse 2, he says, Look out for the dogs, look out for the evildoers, look out for those who mutilate the flesh. He starts with the dogs, which is beast imagery, we would say. Uh, Throughout the Bible, the term dogs is used 
only in bestial terms as a creature that hunts things and rips things up and devours and scavenges for scraps and for blood. Uh, that's what dogs are portrayed as, and some of you have them in your homes. He says, look out for those who act as beasts in the world, who are just living by their instinctual desires, who are devouring whatever they can find. Uh, look out for people who give in to their baser instincts at every turn. He's warning us, don't follow those people. Don't attempt to emulate those people. Their path is not the path of joy. They just live in the moment for themselves, for whatever feels right, and they just charge after that full bore. Don't live like those people. That's not going to get you joy. Just giving in to the carnal desires of the flesh, it sounds like actually a pretty simple way to live, let's be honest. If you just lived moment to moment with what felt like you needed to do, that sounds pretty simple. He says that's not the way that you can be satisfied, though. Look out for those who say it is. Look out for those who live in that manner. We maybe have some recent examples of these carnal people who are just living uh, in the selfishness of their own desires from some of those who are in the riots down south of us and looting and all of these things. And some people have certainly taken advantage of the civil unrest to give in to their carnal fleshly desires. Uh, and they are giving in to these desires to burn, to destroy, to steal, to harm. It's not for the sake of justice in the end. It's for the sake of satiating their own bestial nature. Don't be like them. Paul says that's not the way to joy. That's not the way to peace. He also says look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who choose what is wicked, who do evil. Look out for those who live in debauchery, who live in drunkenness and immorality. This is ever more present and it's even ever more celebrated in our day and age. The, the wild party lifestyle, the spring break lifestyle is popular. It's celebrated. That's truly living these days. If you aren't getting drunk on the weekend, if you aren't sleeping with whoever you can, if you aren't uh, smoking whatever you can, if you aren't forgetting you know, getting blackout drunk and forgetting what happened for the last seven days, then are you truly living? Paul says, look out for those people who celebrate their sin, who flaunt their wickedness at every turn, who care nothing for decency or compassion, but only for their evil deeds. Their path is one of reckless abandon and momentary euphorias, but never lasting joy. Then he finally says, also look out for those who mutilate the flesh. And in the context of the Philippian church, he was likely talking about those who said circumcision was still necessary for salvation. The circumcision, a mark of the Old Testament Israelites, that you were part of their tribe. He says, there are some who are saying that's still necessary for salvation under Christ. And he says, look out for those who mutilate the flesh. And as we read the rest of this chapter, we can also probably say he's referring to those uh, who put confidence in the flesh, put confidence in what they've done, in what they've accomplished, in uh, what they look like, what their appearance is. Look out for those who put confidence in the flesh for salvation or for satisfaction or for joy. There are those who boast in their accomplishments. They put great stock in what they've done. Look out for those people. He says to look out for those people because, in verse 3, we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. So he says, we are the circumcision. He's not talking about of the flesh again. He's talking about of the hearts. Like he says and explains in, in Romans 2.29 that our hearts have been circumcised. This is not of our accomplishments. It's of Christ's. We worship by the Spirit of God. We don't worship by our fleshly efforts, but by the Spirit of God working in us. He says, we glory in Christ Jesus, not in ourselves, not in our evil acts, as those who are evildoers or dogs do. We don't glory in those things. We glory in Christ. And he finishes, we put no confidence in the flesh. None. We don't put confidence in what we can do. Not for salvation, certainly, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 but also not for our satisfaction, not for our joy, not for any standing before God. 
We need to rejoice in the Lord and look out for those who would draw us away from rejoicing in him and worshiping him into living out the passions and desires of our flesh, or in essence, worshiping our flesh. Because we serve what we love. And if we spend our time living as dogs or living as evildoers or living for our accomplishments and our recognition, then we are serving or truly worshiping our flesh, our fleshly desires. And we're saying that the fulfillment of those desires of our flesh will bring joy and satisfaction to our hearts if that's how we constantly live. We're putting confidence in the flesh to accomplish our joy. So look out for people who live that way and who attempt to draw you into doing it as well. That's what Paul is warning the church of this morning. We put no confidence in the flesh because of who Christ is and what he's done. He says, that's got to be your confidence. That's got to be your hope. That's your joy. Not what you've done, what he's done. All that I've done is sin when I'm left to my own desires. My confidence must be in Christ. And now I love what Paul does next. This is something that he does at least one other time in 2 Corinthians, where he boasts about himself to prove a point. He's, he's not doing it because he's full of himself. He's doing it to prove a little bit of a point. Verses 4 to 6 again, he says, in ver- end of verse 3, we put no confidence in the flesh. And then verse 4, though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Paul says, whatever you think you're doing well, I'm doing better. Whatever you think you're, you're at the top of the heap for, no, nah, I got you beat. Paul is the best of the best when it comes to Jewish culture, right? In that day and age, in that region, in that nation, when it came to living for God, no one could, we could say, out-Jew Paul. No one could, could do better than what he was doing for his day, for his age, for his culture. Uh, if you think you've got something to be proud of, Paul's done it better. If you've got good lineage, Paul's got a better one. If you thought you could earn good standing before God, Paul puts you to shame in his learning, in his effort, in his zeal. All of these things. Paul is the top dog in his culture. And he brags in this way for a reason that we'll come to in a moment. No one could outdo Paul in his day and age. And I think my, my mind automatically goes to sports when I'm trying to find an example for our North American culture. Uh, and I think maybe uh, an equivalent for today, and I've used the example before because it's such a good one, uh, would be Tom Brady. Uh, maybe I especially think of it because it's NFL opening weekend. Uh, but Tom Brady, for those of you who don't know, he, he does have everything that could be desired in our day and age, in our culture. He's the embodiment of the North American dream. He's the best quarterback to ever play the game of football. Many would say that at least. Some would disagree, but mostly those who disagree disagree because he's beat their team a whole bunch of times and they're just mad at him. Uh, He has won six Super Bowls, which is more than any other player in the history of the NFL. He has more wins than any other quarterback. So when it comes to athletic success, he's one of the top dogs of all time. He makes more money in a year than I will probably make in my entire lifetime. So financial success, check. That's one of the dreams in North America. He's married a supermodel wife, so we could say his hot spouse. That's a check. Uh, He is still good looking at age 41, so attractive, check. All of these are the North American dream. If you could check off all the things that you would want in North American culture, it would be success, it would be fame, it would be an attractive spouse, it would be being attractive yourself. Uh, All of these things, having money, having the toys that come with it. He has a huge house. He takes vacations to exclusive and very warm places that most of us haven't even heard of, much less could dream of going to. Uh, He's got expensive clothes and cars and watches, so he has the material possessions. Check. He has absolutely everything. Everything our North American culture aspires to have. He outdoes any North American in a way that Paul outdid every Jew, right? For what your culture was going for, this is where we're at. And yet, 
when you bring up and maybe you list all the successes that these guys have, they make shockingly contrasting statements. There was a 60 Minutes interview uh, after Tom Brady won his third Super Bowl, so he's won more since then, but after his third one, this was a few years ago, and uh, he said this. He said, why do I have three Super Bowl rings and still think there's something greater out there for me? I mean, maybe a lot of people would say, hey, man, this is what it is. I've reached my goal, my dream, my life. Me, I think, gosh, there's got to be more than this. The question came, what's the answer? And you can hear in his voice the pleading. He says, I wish I knew. I wish I knew. And he still doesn't know. He's still playing football at the age of 43 years old because he's terrified of what will happen when his flesh lets him down. He's found all of his fulfillment in what he can do. He's found all of his fulfillment in what he can accomplish. And when he can't accomplish it anymore, he doesn't know what's going to happen. And so he puts his body through crazy diets and crazy training each and every year so that he can keep playing football because he doesn't know what's going to happen afterwards. He doesn't know what's going to fulfill him if it's not his competitive drive. And you and I sometimes fall into the trap of thinking the things of the flesh will satisfy us. We compare ourselves on social media with our peers to see how we're doing. We climb the corporate ladder and envy that individual who's just above us. If only I had his job, his paycheck, everything would be better. We push ourselves to be perfect in our image, in our performance. And uh, if we can't be perfect, then sometimes we push our kids to be perfect on our behalf so that we can feel uh, accomplished through them when we couldn't feel accomplished in ourselves. We strive and we strive and we strive to be good enough in and of ourselves and to be fulfilled by the things of this world. No wonder our culture is growing more and more depressed every year that goes by because we're putting all our confidence in ourselves. We're putting all our confidence in what we can do, all the pressure on ourselves to attain some impossible standard. And then when we fail, well, we wonder what's happening to our joy, our hope. We fall into self-loathing and self-doubt. The reality is that all of this striving to be perfect, to have all the stuff and the praise and the money and everything in the world is empty. Tom's got more of it than you do, and even he's not found joy in it. Now let's contrast that with the words of Paul. Paul, when we list all of his accomplishments, all of the things that were going for him, then he comes to verse 7 and 8, and he says, But... Whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Where the things of the flesh didn't satisfy Tom Brady, Christ alone is enough to satisfy Paul. He doesn't have anything else. He's sitting in jail. He has a pen and a paper and Christ. And he says, this is enough. And even look at what he says. He says, whatever gain I used to have. So that means whatever was good, whatever was getting him ahead, whatever was to his benefit in this life, all of these things, whatever gain I had, Not even just the bad things. I lost all those bad things when I got Christ. He says, whatever good things I had, I count them as loss because if they're of the flesh, they aren't worth it. Indeed, he says, I count everything as loss because of what? The surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Those things, I thought they were good for me. They were to my gain. They were putting me ahead in life. They are losing if they aren't getting me Christ. They're not the second best option out of, you know, 500 choices, where it's like, oh, that actually sounds pretty good. It's second best out of 500. That's great. He says, no, 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 this is, you flip a coin. And if you have Christ, gain. If you don't have Christ, loss. 
in your life and mine, there are so many things that we seek out for our gain. Do you seek money? Do you seek popularity? Do you seek good grades? Do you seek a new car? Do you seek the approval of your friends? Do you seek Freedom 55? Do you seek the boat on the lake? Do you seek anything by the flesh? As your goal, as your satisfaction, if I just had that, I'd be good. It won't give you joy. If it's not getting you closer to Christ, if it's not drawing you to him, if it's not teaching you about who he is, it's not, if it's not helping you glory in Christ, it's actually a losing cause. And if that seems a little extreme to you, it, it is. But Paul says it's not because he's trying to rob you of good things in your life. He's trying to give you the best thing. He's saying gaining Christ surpasses all of the good things in your life. Knowing Jesus surpasses everything else good you can think of. That's why Jesus said in John 6.35, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. And in Matthew 8.34-36, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me, for whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? To have Christ and nothing else is gain. So also to choose Christ over anything else is gain. Paul reiterates this in the second half of verse 8. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Now, rubbish is kind of a polite word in our society. I always imagine someone with a British accent saying it, right? Oh, that's simply rubbish. Paul's word in Greek is not a polite word. Uh, we, we kind of put a polite word in here, but his word is, is maybe one that would translate more into some four-letter word in our language that I won't say at church. But everything is a loss compared to Christ. Indeed, I count it so because his surpassing worth makes all else look like dung or refuse. Why would I choose Christ over that? The rest of it is rubbish. The rest of it is awful when I compare it to Jesus. When I get more of him, the rest of the things of this world, the, the fame of this world, the money of this world, it doesn't mean anything. And so as we wrap up here this morning... I want to ask the question, then, what does it look like when we have Christ as our joy? What does it look like when we rejoice in the Lord, as the imperative at the beginning of this section says? And uh, if you'll let me, I, I have a little poem that I'm going to read. So there's some artisticness to it that we have to interpret with us this morning. I think we can do it. Uh, entitled, When Christ is Our Joy. So when Christ is our joy, our minds transformed, our convictions conformed, our desires reformed, our end reward. When Christ is our joy, our fears stilled, our anger chilled, our tears distilled, our pride killed. When Christ is our joy, our strivings cease, our trials peace, our burdens ease, our chains release. When Christ is our joy, our salvation sure, our forgiveness secure, our security endures, our future assured. When Christ is our joy, his grace applied, our souls satisfied, our needs supplied, our hearts abide. When Christ is our joy, his comforts renew, his mercies anew, his promises true, his presence all through. When Christ is our joy, every day rest, every morning blessed, every breath unstressed, every praise professed. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you this morning for the reminder from your word to seek out you as our joy, to rejoice in the Lord, to look out for those who would steal us away, to look out for the things of this world that would steal us away, to not put confidence in the flesh, but to put confidence in Christ and to seek out the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus. Help us to be people who dive into scripture, who are deep in our prayers, who seek after you with everything we got, because we know that knowing you is better than striving for anything else this world can offer us. We pray that you would impress this on our hearts more and more each day, and that you would walk with us as we 
uh, become people who are more and more like you. For we pray this all in your name.